Amen. Matthew chapter 8, when you have it, say amen. amen. I'm going to preach a message for the next 30 minutes this morning entitled, There is Hope for Me Yet. I want you to look at three people and tell them those, what is that, six words, there is hope for me yet. There is hope for me yet. Some of y'all looking at the other person, are you sure about that? <laughs> I'm teasing. Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 8. Let us begin reading in verse number 1. We'll read four verses of Scripture. The Scripture says that when Jesus came down from the mountainside, that large crowds followed him. And a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Verse 3 says that Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the man. And then he said, I am willing, be clean. Immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Again, I'm going to preach a message this morning entitled, There is Hope for Me Yet. Look at two more people and tell them those words. There is hope for me yet. Now set those Bibles down and join hands with that person standing next to you. And let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day that you have made. We have rejoiced. We have praised you. We have sang songs, danced, clapped our hands. We are glad about this day, and we are thankful for this opportunity every Sunday to be able to come into this house, your house, and worship you and praise you and receive from you, communicate with you. But God, at this time, as we join hands, it is simply representative of us joining our spirits, our hearts, our minds into one accord. For your word says that wherever two or three of us touch and we agree, that you are there in the midst of them. And God, because of that, declaration we believe that you are here in this place god i believe i know that you are here you are here and because you are here everything that makes you such a great god is in this place god when you show up power shows up when you show up hope shows up when you show up healing shows up when you show up peace shows up when you show up joy shows up when you show up deliverance shows up when you show up, salvation shows up. When you show up, revelation shows up. When you show up, chains are broken. When you show up, we go from faith to faith. We go from glory to glory. All of these things happen when you show up. The elements of who you are go to work. I thank you that they are here. I thank you that you are here. And I thank you that those elements are going to work right now. Sick bodies are being healed. Even as we pray, God, I thank you that you're healing the sick. You're healing the feeble mind, the sick mind, psychological diseases, battles, bondages that we deal with. God, I thank you for healing the human psyche. I thank you for breaking curses in this place today. I thank you for healing the human spirit, the heart, the emotions. I thank you that you are going to work right now. I thank you for speaking. I thank you for prophetic word running its course. I thank you for revelation going off, business ideas popping into people's minds right now because you're in this place, God. I thank you that that, that an initiating creative gene that only you can give, that only comes from you is at work in this place right now. God, we pray for the person on our left. We pray for the person on our right. We speak, God, take them to another level, take them to another place. God, do in them what they're needing you to do. God, minister to them right now. We pray for them. We pray for our brother. We pray for our sister. God, we thank you for new faith. We thank you for fresh oil. We thank you for fresh revelation. We thank you for a word. We thank you for speaking to them today. We thank you for speaking to us today. We thank you for whatever they may be going through, that you are in complete control. We thank you for it in the precious name of Jesus. In the precious name of Jesus. Now, Father, I die right now. I ask you to speak through me. Let your Holy Spirit say to these, your people, whatever you would want to say today, use me, I'm your vessel. 
in the precious name of Jesus. Everyone said amen and amen. Clap those hands and give God one more praise. Amen. Amen. He's worthy. You may have your seat. There is hope for me yet. One would think that as advanced of a state that humanity has arrived at and the conveniences that this culture has created for itself, that by now we would have arrived to at the least some resemblance of a utopia. But for some reason, tensions run as deep as they ever have. Hatred and bitterness as strong as they ever have. And so my question is why as a people are our dealings, our movements and our meta manifestations in such a way as they are? Why still the tension? Why still the hate? Why still the bitterness? Why still the unsettledness? As a certain Mr. King once famously asked, and I often wonder it as well, can we all get along? Can we all get along? What has made us this people? What has made us this people? What moments have occurred that we have arrived at this moment and I guess more importantly can we in this moment escape the momentum that has us captured within itself before we spiral into an even unimaginably worse condition oh I am sure that the questions that I'm asking you this morning and the wonderings that I have exposed are not all too unfamiliar to you. And I am sure that you ask the same questions and you deal with the same wonderings. It might not be so much on a broad scale as I've presented to you this morning, but on some level and in some fashion, this is all too familiar to so many of us. I might ask these questions concerning the entire state of humanity, but you may ask these questions and have these wonderings concerning the culture that you grew up in, concerning the nation that we reside in, maybe concerning your own family, maybe concerning an organization that you've been a part of. But we all ask these questions and we all have these wonderings. The root of our wonderings is actually found within this common denominator. For if we were to continue to scale this down, what we would find is that if we scaled it down all the way down, we would realize that these same questions and these same wonderings, we did not ask mostly about the world that we live in, nor the culture that we're a part of, nor the family that we call ours, but rather we ask this of and about our own self. What have we become? What have I become? What place have we arrived at? What place have I arrived at? Is my life what I hoped it would be? Is my life what I hoped it would be? Or has life's experiences or a life experience taken the hope out of me? or the hope for me? Is there any hope for me? How many of you have ever asked yourself that? I'll be honest enough to be the first to raise my hand. How many times in my life have I arrived at a moment because of all other moments that have culminated to a point that I ask myself, is there any hope left for me? A hopeless life is a living hell. A hopeless life is a living hell. You could even say that a hopeless life is a literal hell. 
What life is worth living? I asked a very dear friend of mine two days ago sitting at lunch, what life is worth living with nothing to hope for? If we have nothing to hope for, then what in the world are we doing here to begin with? Enough lives with no hope create a world with no hope. What a frightening place to live. What a frightening place to abide in a world that enough lives with no hope have created in turn a world with no hope. It all too much resembles the world that we live in today. Hope is a God element. Hope is a God element. You can't find hope on the table of elements with oxygen. You're not going to see it sitting alongside hydrogen or copper or zinc. Rather, hope comes from a world beyond and a place that's greater. Hope is not anything that you can touch with your flesh. But hope is certainly something that you can feel in a place that's deep beyond your heart. Where does that come from? These yearnings that we have that are inexplicable, unexplainable, can't really be touched with our fingertips, tasted with our tongue, sometimes even heard with our natural ears or seen with our natural eye, yet there is something that drives some of us it's a God element. It's an eternal element. Yeah. Hope was something that existed long before the earth that we see ever got here. Long before God the creator said, let there be light. I believe that created into the fabric of his plan were elements like faith and love and hope. And you have to believe that when you understand that Christ, according to the scriptures, was crucified before the foundations of the world. When you understand that there was elements, when you understand that there was agreements like the one that God says he had with Jeremiah, that I knew you before I ever formed you, before you were even a thought in your mother's mind, you and I had an agreement. There was something that we were working on. And these are where we can sense what I call the God elements, hope. Is there any hope for me? I came to declare that there is still hope for us. There is hope for me yet. There is hope for you. There is hope for your family. There is hope for this city. There is hope for this side of town. There is definitely hope for this nation. And there is hope for this world. Because the God I serve is real. The God I serve exists. And the God I serve is more at work than anyone even acknowledges or is aware of. God is at work in this world that we live in. And many times it takes the world that God has created to arrive at a moment, arrive at a place that seems like it's chaos before we see the God elements explode and the real big bangs begin to happen. Explosions that turn into cosmos and suddenly begin to make sense if we perceive life through lenses, through paradigms that only allow us to view our lives at one instance at a time, then we live more than likely a hopeless life. I'm going to say that again. If we see life through a lens or a paradigm with blinders on that only allow us to see life as one instance at a time, then we live a hopeless life. It's the plan of the enemy who early on in the creation of God, he understood that if he was going to have any kind of success, that he was going to have to engage the human psyche and change the way that you see things, not what you're looking at, but how you're looking at it. Did God really say, we see 
the serpent in the garden intellectually, philosophically engaged this woman named Eve. And he began to reword things to her that made her see something differently than she should have seen it. And it's been his trick all along. And so the human psyche now has been conditioned and trained for some reason naturally to see instances simply as instances and e events that stand in and alone all by themselves. So if we are to look at our life as just instances that stand alone, where is the hope? I was telling the same gentleman at lunch the other day, in order to feel hope and in order to understand God, you have to change your perspective. You have to change the paradigm that you look through. You can see the same events, but when you begin to understand that each and every event is not singular and they don't stand alone by themselves, but they are each and every one of them connected in some unique and most of the time beyond our understanding, which is why the apostle would pray a peace that surpasses all of our understanding. Because when God is at work in our life, he's able to arrange and make sense out of each and every one of these individual events in your life. That's why some of you, when you look back at your life's history, you say these things. Isn't that funny? Because if I would have done that and not have done that, then this would not have happened, which in turn would have not caused that to happen or it did cause this to happen. And I arrived at point A, which turned into point C, and suddenly here I am at point F. And it's just so uniquely interesting the way it turned out. And it's interesting to me that an atheist, a person in denial, will look at these as a series of coincidences. Your life is no coincidence. There is a master architect that has been at work in your life the entire time. It's my plan today to come and take the blinders off to give you a new paradigm to look through. For you to understand, as the Apostle Paul declared in Romans chapter 8, that we know that in all things, God is working together in all things for the good of those that love him, for the good of those that are called. Listen, you're called. Your family is called. Your culture is called. Your granddaddy, who you thought was cursed, was called. How do you know he didn't have to experience the things he experiences to in turn uh, 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 an event happen that, that, that ended up with you arriving at the place that you're at in your life? It's even beyond our check-in time and our check-out time. If we understood how we are all evolving together as a people, it's the same verse of scripture that I just prayed a few minutes ago when we brought these new family members into our body. God is working each and every piece, not just as people, but the experiences that make us the people that we are. And so we find a man in the gospel of Matthew in chapter number eight in a moment in time, trapped by momentum. A leper. The scriptures say that Jesus came down from the mountainside and large crowds followed him. And then the story takes a very interesting turn. There's large crowds that are following Jesus, but there's one man that's going after Jesus. Verse number two tells us that a man with leprosy went after Jesus. Now, I know that the scripture says that he came and he knelt, but somehow he was able to get around the following. And he was able to work his way in front. Now, I don't know if he came from the crowd or if he came from away from the crowd. 
more than likely he came from away from the crowd, you see, because lepers were not allowed to socialize with everyone else. And so he was smart enough to know that the crowd is following this man, Jesus. But if I could get somehow in front of him, then maybe something might change for me. I'm carrying leprosy. I'm carrying something that has touched my life, that has changed my life up to this point. Something that has touched me, an experience I've had in life, an event that I've had to walk through has now defined who I am up to the point that I've had to change my lifestyle because of what I'm carrying, because a moment in time touched me. How many of you walked in here today well, uh, and maybe you're carrying something with you? It's a moment in time that touched you. It's a moment in time that defined you. It's an experience that you had. Maybe it's a few moments or a few experiences, but somehow that moment or those moments turn into a momentum. You see, any moment captured can be momentum. It can be a good moment, but it can also be a bad moment. There's a war going on even in this house today. Over the internet, there's a battle going on. There's a God that is trying to get you to understand that all moments are working together for your good. So capture the good ones, but there's an enemy at work that's trying to keep you trapped inside of a bad one. And some of us, we call ourselves cursed, and am I ever going to be able to get out from underneath this, and is my life really ever going to change? And it's not necessarily that it was predestined that a series of bad events was supposed to happen in your life, but somehow at some point something touched you that captured you, and the momentum has carried you to this point. Yeah. What do you do when you find yourself in this situation? There is no more hopeless feeling in the world than when you've gotten your hopes up on more than one occasion and then it seems like you've been let down. Could you imagine going to the priest as a leopard asking to be cleansed with your hopes high? only to walk away and be let down. How many times have we approached uh, what, what we identify as God in our lives with high hopes, but walked away from it and nothing seemed to change? What a hopeless feeling. Is there any hope for me yet? But I came to tell you many times God will allow you to run to the wrong thing in order to get you to run to the right thing. It's not that you're cursed. It's not that it's bad luck. It's not that you're not called and not chosen. As a matter of fact, I believe that God will set us up and he'll just turn, he'll let you run into every wall that you can possibly run into so that we can run right through the right door and right through the right gate. And, and, and many times it's not God cursing our life and many times it's not because we're not capable, but it's God stepping in and saying you're not supposed to go that way and you're not supposed to go this way and you're not supposed to take that path over there and that road right there is not for you and many of us define those paths and those doors and those roads as success or a better life or maybe that is my from faith to faith and maybe that's my from glory to glory but what God is trying to show you is none of that was I've had you going along this path the whole time because eventually I'm going to run you right up where you're supposed to be if you'll just wait on it and hope for it and watch what God will do in your life. What I love about this man is he's obviously, if you know anything about lepers, experienced some kind of rejection in his life. But there was hope in him enough that he still ran it. I got to cut through some of this message because I don't want to run over time. But he carried enough hope in him that he didn't see this new opportunity come walking by and let it walk by. And too many of us as believers, we've been in suffered rejection, a lot of times stuff. We've set ourselves up with it. And we've set ourselves up so much 
that eventually we say, you know what, I'm not going to try anymore. I'm not even going to try to, we live with the momentum that's captured and the enemy wins when that happens. But I'm looking for a people that say, no matter where my life has taken me, no matter how many disappointments, maybe I feel that I've suffered, no matter how much I feel like maybe I've lived some kind of, uh, through a curse or I wish that experience wouldn't have happened to me or I wish I wouldn't have had to walk through those things. But if you'll just hold on and understand that all of them things were just a setup. They were all just a setup for you to get to a place. Jesus on the mountain comes down, and that's a whole nother message. Jesus ministers on the mountaintop and on the bottom of the mountain, and he finds him at the right place at the right time, and he kneels before him, and interestingly enough, this man was carrying a unique faith and a unique hope. Listen to his vocabulary. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. In other words, I know that you're able to do it. Let's press pause here for just a moment. What was it that made this man, first of all, have the hope that God is able, have the hope that this man, Jesus, is able in the condition that he found himself in? Let's go to school here for just a minute. Because obviously it had not happened for him yet. Obviously he's been a leper. He ain't been healed. He hasn't been cleansed. But there was something that convinced him that you're able to do this. Oh, for a people that would stop saying, my church ain't necessary. Going to church isn't necessary. I can have a relationship with Jesus all by myself. I don't need you to tell me nothing. I don't need to assemble myself with you. I don't need to gather to you. Oh, for people that would learn that we are all in this thing together. And may I propose to you that this man knew that Jesus had the ability to heal, maybe because he had even just heard that he had done it and he didn't write it off as hearsay. Sometimes God will allow somebody else to walk through something just to build your faith. The question is, are you going to allow it to do so or not? Are you going to begin to accept that God, even though he might not have done it for you yet, do you still know that he's able to do it? I came to declare to you, my God is able. My God is able to fix you. My God is able to heal you. My God is able to favor you. My God is able to bless you. My God is able to do above and beyond all that you could ever ask or imagine of him to do. My God has a capacity. My God has a capability that is beyond what any of us could ever imagine. My God created this universe and all of the intricacies that scientists still can't even come close to figuring out about this universe and the the way that it transpired to the place that it has arrived at and the way that the earth rotates around the sun. Simple little stuff all the way down to the way the human brain works and we can't even figure out 5% about that stuff. But my God created that because my God knows how to use things that don't make no kind of sense to make perfect sense of it all. My God is certainly able. And if you came in here and you needed a little reminder and a little refresher that God is capable, let's go ahead and get that squared up first of all. God is capable of healing you. I know maybe you've been sick for a few years. You've been dealing with that crazy person for a few years. You can't seem to shake that relationship. You can't seem to shake that little psychological disorder. You can't seem to shake that little emotional state you've been in. I don't care how long it's been for you. I don't care how much rejection you've been having to walk through. My God is 
still able no matter where you find yourself out how do I know because I've seen him do it maybe he has not done it with you yet but I've seen him do it with other people I've seen him do it in my own life I've seen him do it in my father's life I've seen him do it for friends if he can do it for them then why can't he do it for you sometimes we need to learn to reboot our faith to reboot our hope and know that if God can do it for somebody else if he can bless them he can bless me if he can favor them he can favor me if he can heal their body he can heal my body if he can fix their marriage he can fix my marriage if he can save their kids he can save my kids if God can do it for one person he can certainly do it for another person God shows no favoritism to any man God looks at us all the same and if God did it for them then he's going to do it for you it's just a matter of when it's just a matter of how but he is certainly capable and he is certainly able if you believe that God is able I'm gonna give you about three seconds maybe five seconds to give him that kind of praise and said God I know you're able God I know you're capable God I still believe in your capacity I don't know what's going on with me but I know that you haven't changed you are the same yesterday you are the same today and you are the same forevermore God you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask above all that I could think God you are able you are able able if he is able then what calls me to arrive let's ask this question let's ask this question if we know that he's able which we know that he's able then what would cause me to arrive at a place where I would doubt that he's willing to do it. I know that he's able, but something has happened that has caused me now to doubt if I'm this man with leprosy. It's not that my sickness that I'm carrying, I feel is beyond his reach and beyond his capability. I just confessed, I know that what I'm carrying on me is within your grasp. You have the ability to heal me. That's not the issue that I'm bringing to the table. Here's what I've learned about people, Pastor Norris. The issue that they're bringing to church, the issue that they pray about, more importantly, the issues that they deal with in here is not, what I've gone through is it too much for God. It's not that. But somehow we begin to develop a self-perception that there is something about me that is deeper than the disease that I carry. 
that would make a loving Jesus, that would make a loving God reject me. That's what I came to deal with today. Not the disease you're carrying. Let's go past that. I want to know what is it that would make any of you think that God is not willing to do what you know he's very well capable of doing for you. Is it delay? Is it rejection? Is it maybe, and I'm going to go ahead and interject this, that you have bought into the fact, not the fact, excuse me, let me change that, the lie, that what you are carrying has now become greater than who you really are. Have you allowed this thing to define you to such a point that you don't even remember what you used to look like before that thing got a hold of you? It's not that God couldn't heal it. But do I believe that I have become what I'm looking at every single day in the mirror? Or can I somehow retrace my steps back to that point that that thing touched me, that that moment captivated me, to remind myself there was a place in time when I saw myself it might have been as a 15-year-old boy. Maybe I was eight years old. Maybe I was a young man in his 20s, a young woman in their late teens that had aspirations and dreams and hopes for myself, but some experience in life came and impacted me and changed me. And the moment caught me, and it turned into a momentum that has brought me to this place. Now I don't even believe who I used to be, that person that believed that I would become. Let's deal with that thing. That's why we don't believe God is willing. Because we start to believe maybe it was all a lie to begin with, Pastor Norris. It never was the truth. There never was hope for my life to begin with. Because if there was, then how did things transpire to this place? There's deliverance for you today. There's deliverance for you today. God is not only able, and everyone standing to your feet, God is willing. God is willing. Let's take it a step further. He is willing in the sense it is the will of God. And if it was not the will of God, then God would have never allowed you to be inserted into this plan. God does not speak failures into this world. God does not speak mistakes into his creation. God does not speak mistakes into his purpose. God does not speak failures into his plan. When God sent you here, the hope that you carried as a young man, the hope that you carried as a young woman, the hope that might have been snatched away from you still exists. It still exists. And many times God will allow things to transpire, listen to me, like the man that was blind. Why was he born blind? What happened? It was so the glory of God can be shown. In other words, the God elements go to work through what we deem and perceive as the ugliest phases of our life. That's when the God elements begin to shine and radiate and show up in your life. Don't you know that? Don't you know that? Don't you know that every event that has happened in your life, God is working it all out so that at some point and at some time, you are going to have to look at your life and other people are going to have to look at your life and they're going to have to say only God could have done that. Only God could have been involved in that.
Look at somebody and tell them he is willing. The Apostle Paul wrote in the chapter that I quoted earlier, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed and to be made manifest. For the creation, including us, was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one that subjected it in hope, in hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. In other words, it was all a plan to begin with. You're saying, Pastor Dustin, everything I've had to walk through, yes, it was all a plan to begin with. There is still hope for you yet. There is still hope for me yet. I'm still alive and kicking and breathing. I'm still in this church on a Sunday morning. I'm still clapping my hands. I'm still giving God glory because God is not finished with me yet. My best day is yet to come. And it's not just because God is able, but it's because it was his will and he wants to. In this hope, we were saved. Hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Skip down and he says, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love them, who have been called according to his purpose. Because God foreknew those he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, the same son that suffered, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. I came to encourage you, brother, and I came to encourage you, sister. There is still hope for you. Do not give up on yourself because God is not giving up on you, but more importantly, learn to run and position yourself when the time is right. When you walk into a service like this and you see God show up in a place like this, it is the perfect time, it's the perfect opportunity for you not to follow everybody else, but run up in front of what everybody else is doing. Drop on your knees. I'm waiting for the day to come once again. Did somebody bust out of the praise and worship service and come running up to this altar on their own? The, 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 the kind of service where you don't need a preacher saying come up to the altar now. The kind of service where you don't need a sister chica saying go ahead and lift those hands now. But at some point and sometime somebody is going to catch the revelation that I can get ahead of all this and I can posture and position myself in his will and begin to understand things about my situation that I never saw before. I'm going to give you about three minutes to go ahead and let the word soak in. Did you receive anything today? I want you to go ahead and enter into worship if you please.